The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. I need more Amy, please. Okay. Check your vocal, Amy. Check, 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 check. Lots more Amy. Um, I need more me. More Amy, Amy in Amy. 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 Amy needs more Amy. Hello. Check, 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 check. It's weird, like I can hear it. same time doing facing left I'm <clears throat> doing facing left facing right saves the rest Nevada fights sure. one two one two three four facing left facing right saves the rest Nevada fights Okay, how are we doing Nevada? Nevada fight. Well, on, our well we, on our demo, you're doing a little differently than we did on the demo. The okay. fight's a little faster. Well, so. Let's do it. Let's do it all one way. Yeah. Which way should we do it? The you you want to push a little bit. Nevada the fight. Right? Okay, you you that's do. okay. That's yeah. what we learned. That's what we learned as right. well. So, yeah. Doing Nevada fights right now. Two, three, four. Nevada, Nevada fights. fights. Okay. So we just jump on yeah. mic a little bit. Okay. Uh, the one thing I'm missing is the, uh, the final consonant. You want lots of S's on the end? Well, yeah, I want to Okay. Like this. Nevada fight and not fights. That's correct. Okay. So well, you can do fights. Uh, just make sure you do sa if you're going to do it. Okay. Don't do it. Don't do it. Do we want to start do the set? Sa. Yeah. Do we want to start the set over? Or we want to keep moving? No, let's run this again now that we got this mix, and then we can then we can rock and roll. Oh, Jonathan? Make sure you don't fall into And then it's always. And you're Do you do that? Yeah. No. I don't think it's good.
never hear off of a rock and roll stage or a rock and roll stack or something. It's got really some great depth to it. Plus, it's just cosmic beyond all cosmic. You know? So, if we can do that, but I don't want to spend hours trying to scope it out. If somebody gets lost and we're in a cul-de-sac and it's going to good, 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 we'll walk away from it. And yeah, you know, and I think I think part of what we want to do is is in terms of being easy going, is just take a page out of the dead book, you know, just say we can play as long as we want, anything we want, which is not exactly true. What I want to try to replicate in some some degree is the first national band experience, and the first national band experience for me was the end of the monkeys. I didn't have a job. I didn't know what to do. So a couple of guys said, let's put a band together. And that was the first national band. And I wrote a whole bunch of songs. That's these songs. And that all happened 60 years ago. <laughs> that all happened 60 years ago. So now it's back among us. And uh, that's fine. <laughs> I don't know why it makes me laugh, but it does. <clears throat> and um, uh, what I, I hope that we can do is catch that spirit, I don't see any reason we can't. It's a universal spirit and it should, should serve us well. Those are those are my notes. My confidence is uh, eight and above, but <clears throat> until we actually deliver this thing, yeah. we gotta we gotta roll it all the way down all the halls of the hotel and have it show up and still be a nice beautiful souffle. Right. And so um, I think we can do that. This is a, <clears throat> a complete excursion for me, but I'm sure it is for all the guys too. So it should be fun. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Okay, let's go to work. I wasn't writing for the monkeys because I've never been able to write for anything. Uh, haven't been able to, you know, I, I would not make a good journalist or a chronicler of stuff like that because I can't do that. And so when the, it came time to, here, write this song like you think, uh, Harry Como would, would sing it. My answer was always, who? Uh, you don't mean the guy from the 50s television, 15-minute shows that sang? Yeah, him. I, well, I, I couldn't write. Well, write it more like a pop. You know Tommy James and the Shondells? Said, no. Said, well, well, you know, pop music like you hear on Top 40 radio. And what I was listening to was the music on my own stereo system, and the mu music on radio was dominated basically by the Beatles mm -hmm. and the early Beatles stuff. And so the definition of a pop song uh, became mysterious to me. I didn't, I couldn't tell what they meant by a pop song. And I'd say, well, how about this? And I would play them different drum. I'm only saying that not because Different Drum became a hit, but because everybody kind of understands what it is, and that's the way I write music. And I said, will this work? And they said, oh, no, that won't work. And so I was flummoxed, and I was stopped, and I thought, well, <clears throat> then, then, the, then the mind started turning, and this goes to, the, goes to the conversation we can have right now, which is, well, what's the music, musical base for this band, this, this uh, mysterious fictional band because by that time you know I walked in and they said we have this band it's called the monkeys we'd like you to play in it and it has a television show associated with it so you'll need to perform if you ever performed and and you'll have to look good on camera and we can see how that works and so forth and if you'd like to be in this band we'd, we'd like you to do that <clears throat> so I came in with the ideas oh okay well this is a band they need somebody who can play guitar. Sadly, that's not exactly me, but I can do my best. And they need music, and I can write some songs, like Different Drum, and I can do this other kind of stuff, and without exception, and I, I really don't want to get too far down this road because it's a little more political than I want to get it down, but without exception, they kept saying no, 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 no. They being Bert, Bob, Steve, Ward, Jim, name after name after name, Kirshner, Brill, all of those guys kept saying, no, that is not pop song. That's not a pop song. And that shut me down. Because it was like, well, that's what I write. Okay, let's do Joanne. <clears throat> I 
we gonna have the intro? Like we all like there's there's, a, there's the, the proper intro. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
Tried, uh, the, it, there was an effort made to explain it to me, and they said, "Well, it's, you know, you don't you don't want any twang in there because twang sounds sounds kind of ignorant to the upper northeast, and while it may be, uh, you know, appealing to the lower southeast, you know, they really like hee haw, and so hee haw is not where we want to go. I don't think hee haw was on at that point, but that's my right. I'm I'm just making a point with it, and it, it they had this sense of regionality and the way they'd put the band together is one guy's from the northeast one guy's from southern california one guy's from england and another guy is from the south from texas and so we were fit we were cut to put into that mold and then as we began to express ourselves, express the character that we thought we were playing with the character that we had naturally to us which is that was my only option because i wasn't really a, a trained actor when those sort of things all came into play, we pushed up against the edge of the entire concept itself. Right. And, and at that point, I started thinking, well, then what is this thing? Because we're right in the ring with the Stones and the Beatles. And by that, I'm talking about the size of the effort. Yeah. The Beatles were international multi-million, and the Monkees were international multi-millions, but not from the same platform. You know, the, the whole music scene was burgeoning, mostly in England, and it was producing some of the best music of its time. And it was due to this rising sense of what constitutes a critical path. Let me see if I can get this right, because I'm getting into definitions, but what constitutes a critical path for a band? It was what defines the band, what makes it turn into a band, why is it a band? All those questions and all those answers had to come into play in order to start a band and none of those questions were asked and none of those questions were answered in the show, the monkey show, and all of them were asked and all of them were answered in the British, the British uh, invasion, revolution. Right. And, and in, in my case, the Beatles, I was, a, I was an ardent focused Beatle fan because I loved the way they wrote songs. John and Paul wrote songs.
you know, you have to answer the question of not only how are you going to do what you're going to do with the band, but why are you doing that? What is the, what's the focus? What do you want to do? What is, why are you singing this song about this subject right now? Why are you singing uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is, you know, at best kind of pop fluff, yeah. but <clears throat> rendered in such a way that you knew something was up. And, wow, listen to those voices, listen to those harmonies, listen to that melody structure. Listen, to, All that is non-trivial. And maybe I want to hold your hand is a little silly, but it's it wasn't when you heard it on the radio. And it wasn't when you heard it delivering. Because it was delivering to a focused element, which was how do they look? What do they wear? What's their hair like? Um, what are they doing? Are they going to play concerts? Are they going to play dance halls? Are they going to play the cavern? Who are these guys? Why are they doing this? And I don't know who started to define all of it because there were as many bands in England as there were people. I mean, everybody was in a band. Right. And, you know, the Beatles was one of them. And it was skillfully managed so that it kept emerging. They were releasing records, every one of which would go to number one, and they would bounce up. But what was bouncing up was this concept, this sense, the Beatles. And and I don't, I, if, if I was to write a, uh, no, I don't know, a, <clears throat> if I was to do a report or, you know, a, a grant thesis or a grant work on the Beatles, I don't even know where I would start. I, know, I mean, I don't. I mean, I know a little bit about uh, the uh, a rock and roll band or a band of people that make mu music, and almost nothing about a band of people who play soccer. But they're all the same dynamic. Sure, it's all a band. It's a band, and everybody plays their role. So n nobody was doing that at the Monkees, but they were doing it at the Beatles. And I was writing to that. What happens when a band plays as a band? What happens when you have bass, guitar, piano, synthesizer, kazoo, and rhythm? And what happens when that ensemble comes together and they start to make music? What kind of music do they want to play? In, uh, in elementary school, when you're seven years old, the first day of school, and they sit you down in the music room and hand you something that makes noise, clatter, 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 they don't teach you any of that. And they didn't teach me any of that in my high school and my elementary school or anything. You know, what is the core uh, element of a band? And the, and the answer is so obvious and so easy, I, I guess it's just, you know, assumed that everybody knows. The answer is music. So <clears throat> it, it required an understanding of music that was outside the technical constraints of the understanding of music, a spiritual understanding of music. Do you ever walk along on a nice day and you're happy and have a melody start playing in your head? Well, of course you do. Everybody does that. Is it a melody you've heard? Maybe. Did you hear it on the radio? Maybe. Did it just pop into your head? Eh, maybe. All of those things are happening. And <clears throat> if you're in my situation, I was surrounded by music all the time in my thinking and just where I saw it, and once I discovered the roots music of Texas, I, under, I began to understand where that music was coming from. That was country blues, uh, and it was out of the southeast, and some out of Nashville, and marrying, you know, there on the Texas Gulf Coast, and up through Houston, and coming up through Austin, and making itself known in that way, and and it it had, by virtue of that, it had a personality. It had a raison d'etre. It had a reason to be. People danced to it, made love to it, made babies to it. Um, there was a uh, a presence. <laughs> it was on every car radio. Mm -hmm. There weren't really radios in homes at that point. The only radio I knew was in a car. And the radio that I knew at home was in the kitchen that would read the news to my mother as she got ready for work. This was before Top 40 radio. And the one in the car 
was playing uh, DJs like uh, you saw in American Graffiti. <laughs> and we're doing 27 minutes after, and that kind of thing. And you had that sort of DJ presence in there that was clatter and clutter to me. But at the bottom line, it was music, and music, you know, was rhythm and tone and everything else. All right, thank you. I'll with your volume. Go ahead.
It wasn't too long after the monkeys that it began to dawn on me that what is critical path is the reason to do it. Why are you doing this? What is it that you're delivering to the people who come to see you? Well, you can say it's a good time. Uh, it's uh, an evening noise. It's all that kind of thing. But for me, it was a deep spiritual sense that was unspoken and unsung unless you wrote it and sang it. I had to write it and sing it, so I did that. And what, and therein, it, that's embedded in the lyric of the songs that I wrote. Right. When I when I rolled all that in to the powers that be at the monkey, they said, "Well, we don't. First of all, we don't like it because it's twangy and it's country and it sounds like you're stupid. And second of all, we don't know what you're talking about. This is all." acid flashes and it's just because you're smoking a bunch of dope and you don't really know what you're talking about. But really what had happened is I had just stepped off into the to the other world that these guys had discovered and I was saying wait for me, wait for me, wait for me. And <clears throat> it was to distill that environment into song and sound and music in my head that I worked. I thought I gotta I gotta render this in poetry. And I don't know how to do that. I can start singing, but I don't sing all that good. And a lot of people made their way because they sang good. And a lot of people made their way because they played well. Like, you know, play. But mostly it was because they had something to say. And and in my case, and I think in many of the cases of the people in the sixties, the guy who had the most to say was Dylan. And he, you know, it whipped my head around. I thought, I've never heard that on Dick Clark. I never heard that at school. And, you know, the songs that he was writing were just, they were to the pulse of the times. And I, and I realized he was singing uh, as the Pied Piper. Well, that's the wrong metaphor. But as the enchanter of his generation. Who gave gave us all a voice, and uh, and God bless him for it. And I sang his songs, <laughs> I sang all of them, and I tried to sing them like him back when I was you know eleven. Sure. But that's not going to happen in the Monkees, and that's not going to happen really any place in Los Southern Los Angeles. Where it's going to happen, it's going to happen when you when the band coalesces, and what do they co coalesce around? They coalesce around the music. So you have to start with the music. Well, what's the music about? Well, most of the time it's about love songs. What about lost love? What about the death of a treasured uh, parent or grandparent or child? What about death in general? What about sorrow? What about high lonesome? What about all these things? Are they rendered in song? Well, yes, they are. And I was watching the Beatles touch that. And I was watching the, uh, Dylan give us all, all a license to do it. And then it dawned, dawned on me, as these things were, like a continuous sunrise, was that that's not uh, just the reason to do it, it's critical path. You have to do it if you're going to make music. You've got to have uh, something to say. You, gotta have, you, have to, you have to say, my heart is broken. Really? So's mine. Why is yours broken? Well, they didn't have my favorite malt lager. Well, okay, maybe that's trivial. Why did yours break? Well, because my, my girlfriend ran off with another guy. That was Gary Shandling's joke. I told, I, I broke up with my girlfriend because she moved in with another guy. <laughs> it makes me laugh to think about it now. And so there, there are these unspoken, unsung ideas that we live by that when they are sung and when they are spoken, energize me and lift me up and make it possible to make it through the next 15 minutes. Four minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, half solo, right? Uh, e well, one round of chords. For the it's, solo. I'll do it 
do it this way. Uh, do it here. Plus, why are you making little mini Mickey Mouse fingers all over it? Just to make you laugh. <laughs> One verse solo. Right? Hi, Minnie. And a verse solo is a length of a verse. Right? Hey, boom. Just one I don't, round. I don't understand what happened. This here. much. So I, we do this. And a verse solo, because I don't have room on the paper, is one chord progression. One. So you're saying this is nomenclature for that? No, just this. Nope. This is nomenclature for that. Verse one, verse two, chorus, verse solo, which is the solo over a verse. So where's the solo go? It's right after, after the chorus. chorus. That's why I've done this plus here. You do the chorus, then after that you add a round of a solo over the verse chord changes. Well, okay. Is that not how you want it written? No, that's good. That's good. I'll write it a different way on the document. We can print another one. It would have been better if there were Mickey Mouse. But you know what I think is a better way than yeah, that? Just always. No. Is to print the chord changes twice. You know the
second half of the first I'm going to creep right off from the top. I'll creep in. I'll creep in. I'll creep in from the downbeat. See how I'm going to I'm going to creep in. I'm going to creep from the downbeat. Okay. I'll creep in later. Yeah, we can just let it go. I mean, don't even don't even start where it's, you know, at the beginning. Let the chords. record. I like the record you freaking made. You can hit the vibers button. Hey, I'm never going to hear the end of that. I can't hear Okay, blow whistle.
So now I'm done with the monkeys. I'm on timeline. I'm out of work. And I'm back to being this guy from Texas. This guy who can't play very well. This guy who warbles rather than sings. And but I figured I got a lot of license here, you know. I mean I can you know, Dylan didn't sing all that well. <laughs> Although I loved the way he sang, you know, which sure wasn't, you know, Perry Como. Or Mitch who did we decide it was? Mitch Mitchell? Mitch Mitch Miller? Miller, yeah. Yeah, Mitch Miller. There wasn't the Mitch Miller singers. Yeah. There wasn't any of those things. It was it was completely new and it was coming from England and it was coming from it was coming from the Stones and the Beatles and from Hendrix, who was ours, if you want to do Nations. What was all this stuff that was, was coming in? What are you going to do? Because you're already informed, and they tell you you can't sell country music and you can't sell this. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make enough music. And besides that, it's stupid. The steel guitar. They didn't like the steel guitar. You figure it was the steel guitar? Yeah. Well, I know that... My mother pointed that out. I don't like the way that guitar just goes and swirls. Sounds like the lady in front of me in church sings the hymns. And I understood that. But I also saw, and my own sense of it was, well, actually, these things are a touch of the infinite in this music. And if you expand that, you're expanding the spiritual side of it. So... John Ware, who was the drummer for the First National Band, and John Keeney, John London Keeney, who was the bass player for the First National Band, were friends. And we talked about this. And, well, what would the, what would the band be? And, and they both said, so, well, just do what you do. And I, in my mind, I just told you what I thought I did was not sing very well, not play very well, not write very well. So I thought, well, that's not how you start. But <clears throat> they were both, no, what you're doing there is different and it's, it's useful. And I had a friend of mine who would drive me around from time to time, and he would, he would say, that, those songs that you sing are great. He was English. He said, those songs that you sing are fantastic. And the cats in Nashville thought they were fantastic. Well, too. by the time I got there, they sure did. Yeah. And played them for him, and they said, man, this is good stuff. Who wrote this? <laughs> and I was happy to say me. Uh, <clears throat> and I... I, I I was so far on the outside of the traditional Hollywood business and the Nashville business and anywhere the music centers were because I was seen as being a rebel. I was seen as being, I was against the success of the Monkees, um, which was not true, and uh, that I was against uh, uh, the songs that they were making and so forth, also which was not true. What was, what was true is that I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't music that I liked. It wasn't music that I listened to. Yeah. But it was all fair. I, 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 that wasn't my job. My job was not to like that. I didn't want to, you know, uh, impress Stockhausen on the on the uh, on an unnerved nerved world. I wanted, I wanted beautiful music wherever I could find it. And if that was in a supermarket, that was okay with me, or an elevator. I didn't care. But if I wanted to sing it myself and write it myself, I had to have an understanding of what that music was. So the first place I looked was in my own history, which was hillbilly country. And then I started looking at the other kind of influences. Where am I going to find the stuff that I really love? And as I've written in my book, where I found it was in Bo Diddley and his rhythms, and where I found it was in the blues and not so much in country music, except it, as it was rendered by guys like Hank Williams and so forth, and Jerry Lee and Johnny Cash and those, you know, the, the big guns, the big lions. And I thought, I can, I, can, I can fly in that flock if I can, you know, not to compare myself to them, but, you know, I, they're not doing aerobatics that I can't do. I can do that. that that's, that sounds pretty good to me. And from that beca began to be, well, why don't we get, you know, country players and who's the first guy you want to guess? Well, Red Rhodes. He's the steel player down at the Palomino and he's the guy that, that I want. And I talked to Red and I realized Red was not anywhere on this page. He was a very conventional 
country steel player. But he had these wild swings, and I and I and I turned him on. I, th I think I, we talked about that already. Yeah. And once he got turned on, those wild swings became just magnificently wild. They went crazy off the charts, and he was playing out loud what I was hearing in my head. And, the band slowly began to play, my band, First National Band, started begin to, beginning to play what we were hearing in our heads as a collective. And that's when a band really starts to come together, in my mind, is when everybody hears the same song in their head, you call it different things, we're on the same page, we're playing the same song, so on and so forth. But everybody is of one mind about where one should be, what key it should be in, what instruments it should be, and so forth. And, and within it's a lot of room. And you saw the Beatles really, you know, venture out into these extraordinary territories. Uh, and I thought, well, I can do that too. And so <clears throat> it wasn't so much I was inspired by the Beatles, but I was certainly inspired by the tenor of the times and sure. people who were doing it. Everybody from, oh, this side of the pond to that side of the pond. And it was... It was a great time to be in music, in a band, looking for some place to play. And I had this weird appendage called television that was starting to follow me around and, you know, uh, give, give me a, uh, an introduction into wherever I went, whether it was a restaurant or a grocery store. And so it was, it was weird for me, but the four of us, John, Red, me, and Johnny kind of had a uh, focus on saying something's coming out of this, and let's let's continue to play it. Let's let's see how it will go. But it never it never got the commercial traction that I wanted it to. And I was watching the Monkees records get huge commercial traction, and I thought, well, those guys, those guys knows know something I don't know. And always when that thought would come into me, right behind it would be, that's nothing you need to know. Let them know it, let them go make the music. You need to know how to extinguish a cobalt fire. You need to know something very arcane. You're after something here that only certain people get in this door. And if you don't know how to extinguish a cobalt fire, don't set it on fire. <laughs> And so I pulled back from that and moved to another thing where there was, it was organically based. It was, it came from someplace inside, not from someplace outside, where you say, oh, let's play it like they play it. Let's right. play it like he says it. Let's sing it like she sings it. Let's, let's dress like her. Let's get uh, a, a lead singer that's cute and short or cute and tall or black, white, or pink, whatever it was, let's do it. But it was all coming from the outside. And turning on the inside, you get you turn back in on this, what's really pushing this music? And for me, I wanted it to uh, be my means of livelihood. And I want, and, and so the idea that it would be the First National Bank, which is where I kept my money, and turn it into First National Band made perfect sense. Sure. Stash it there, and it's a good joke. Well, it's maybe not a good joke, but it's a joke.
ask you about Grand Ennui. Um, for years I thought that was a song about running from a woman. <laughs> it's running from boredom. Right. It's um, running from that moment where you realize is this all there is? And you go, oh my God, I, this is not where I thought I was going to end up. And you, there's this glimmer on the far horizon of that's Nirvana, let's go there. I mean, there are even bands named Nirvana, I think. <laughs> and they say, let's go there. What could possibly happen? Well, maybe suicide or maybe something absolutely disastrous. <laughs> it could happen. If you're running away from something, if you're running from the Grand Ennui, which is right in back of you on a steed of fire, it could take you into nowhere could take you into the darkness, into all the lights shut off. But if you unhook from it, and you get out of the car and you tell the princess to go home, and you get back and take your shoes off and get on the grass or the sand and start a nice slow walk in the direction of the light, you realize that you're outrunning the ennui by just a slow stroll. You don't have to race. Ennui is forever behind you, never in front of you. <laughs>
said, said well. Right here. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> glad you made it, man. Me too. <laughs> Who said wow? If you have a point of view, and if you can render that point of view in your art, photography, painting, musicianship, then you've got two of the elements that are combustible. Get them together in a room, raise the temperature a little bit, and you're going to have warmth all the rest of your life. And that's what the First National Band is to me. It's the expression of those ideas as a, as a band. Now, the Redux, well, that's a whole other thing. Because Redux is 50 years after the first First National Band. And it is the First National Band with new players, people who come up who can play better than we could ever play. And this new album that we've just made, Redux, is the best album I've ever made. I can say it unequivocally. I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not this, saying it foolishly. The, the songs were the best I've ever heard. Of. Well, see, yeah. and and it was it was for me too. I thought, yeah. oh man, that's great. Who wrote that? <laughs> you did, Nez. Yeah. Uh, really? Like times have caught up to you. And times Something, have caught yeah. up to. I feel it. I know what you're talking about. I don't know how to describe it in any way other than you are, and uh, and I I don't. I, I don't think I want to spend too much time trying to figure out how to describe it because it takes me away from the focus. I could see a future for this band. I can see something really great waiting for us to go out and, you know, play a stadium and play a, a country and, and do that kind of stuff because the music has that kind of sustenance to it. And the players are just amazing to work with. And you listen to it. I've never been happier with a record and never been more proud and and happy to get it out in front of people and to take it and give it to people. It's, it's uh, right now, I'm at the, it's at the top of my form. This is the best I can do. So if I die now, that was it, guys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Esmond.